Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming in attendance to this event. We think it should be pretty interesting, and we appreciate your patience with the slight logistical issues with the food. Uh, my name is Victoria Sampson. I'm the Washington Office Director for the Secure World Foundation. The Secure World Foundation is a private operating foundation that promotes cooperative solutions for space sustainability. Our vision is the secure, sustainable, and peaceful use of outer space that contributes to global stability on Earth. We work with governments, industry, international organizations, and civil society to develop and promote ideas and actions for international collaboration. Um, to, I'm, what we're going to do is have our speakers go down the line and give a brief discussion, and we're going to go and have a moderated panel and then open up for Q&A. But I want to give just a little bit of an overview very quickly, and then go on to things. I feel like this is probably obvious, but the nature of the space domain has changed. <laughs> There's been a shift in how we approach space that affects our possibility for space and security. Um, the goal is a stable, predictable space environment that will allow us to get, um, enjoy continued benefits from use of and access to space. As more nations depend increasingly on space assets for the national security and socioeconomic development, the loss of these space assets, whether real or theoretical, and actions taken in response to these losses could spark or escalate conflict on Earth. Moreover, certain types of military actions in space could have long-term negative impacts on the space environment. Um, there's an, and of commercial entities. Um, they're becoming much more prevalent. Space used to be largely nation states, and now you have a lot of commercial actors as well. And then you have actors um, getting involved in terms of different domain types. You have small sat operators becoming a huge change. Um, and we'll be going into more discussions of that later on. And then you have more countries adding launch capabilities and more just having access to satellites itself. Um, in terms of looking at Resiliency, interference, even theor theoretical with space assets, is perceived to be a huge disruptor. And many governments are focusing on how to maintain their ability to receive continued access to their space assets no matter what happens, um, as space is a crucial part of national security infrastructure, economic, and daily lives. And the U.S. national security community is focused on the resiliency of space assets. I think probably resiliency is a key word everyone's heard a million times. I'll hear it a million times more today. But looking into the changing attitude for space protection, that's really what we hope this panel will be going digging into deep. And one of the issues we're seeing internationally for these discussions is the concept of self-defense in space. Looking at, okay, what is it? Is it allowed? How do we deal with it? How do we do it in a way that's not going to be automatically um, escalating crises or making things into a crisis that do not necessarily have to be these? So identifying threats of what the first step can be. The international community can do a lot to mitigate these threats, but, but the first step is just kind of identifying what those threats are. And I think with that, I will stop since we're um, short on time and go on to our first. We're going to basically go down the line. You should have bios of all the speakers in front of you. So um, our first speaker will be my colleague, Brian Whedon. Thanks, Victoria. Um, so I, I thought. I would start by kind of setting the stage and, and focus more on uh, what's changed in terms of national security space, why it's a, a big issue nowadays, nowadays or, or uh, it's come back as an issue, um, and kind of try and summarize some of the steps that have been taking and, and some of the unanswered questions that are still out there. Uh, I mean, for those that have been paying attention, I would say that, you know, space security is cool again uh, for, you know, a while there, it seemed like no one was talking about things that had been talked about decades ago with military activities in space and potential conflict in space. Um, but there's been a, a significant change in the tone uh, and language used by several of the, the top leadership across the United States government and the national security world. Um, you know, people are talking openly about the possibility of conflict in space, although usually following it with saying that, well, we need to avoid that. Um, there's talk about space being more threatened than ever. Uh, which I think is questionable. It depends how you kind of frame it. Um, and there's also been talk about a need to shift towards uh, more of a warfighting culture within the military space operations world, which basically means thinking about when you're conducting space activities and providing space capabilities to the warfighter, um, you need to be able to th be actively thinking about uh, who might be trying to interfere with that uh, and what steps can be done to, to mitigate that which again is not different than what other people when they're pilots flying in a war zone or ships operating, uh, Navy ships that are operating have to think about. So what's driving this? Um, you know, a couple of big, big trends. Uh, I would say that, you know, space itself in the national security context has gone from 
mainly be, uh, or I would say, a strategic contributor to one that contributes at all levels of national security activities. So for, throughout much of the Cold War, and in fact some of the early beginnings of national security space, its main focus was strategic in nature. It was providing intelligence to top-level decision makers. It was verifying arms control treaties. It was nuclear warning uh, and command and control. People talk about the 93 Gulf, Gulf War as being kind of the first space war. I think it's more accurate to say it was more of an experiment and that it was kind of the first time that space capabilities were used kind of in an operational and tactical context. Uh, but really it's been the last 15 years in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere that you've really seen space capabilities be used down to the war fight on the ground and become integrated into everything the US military does. Uh, it's very hard to think about how the US military can do the kinds of things it's been doing the last 15 years and project power on the world without having space capabilities. Um, and there's a couple of, of, of you know, results of that. One is that much more of the national security community now cares about space. It's not just the space people talking about space. You now have people up to the Deputy Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of Defense now talking about space and space security, which I think is a, is a significant change. Um, but at the same time, you have these capabilities that were once kind of set aside and were limited to more of a strategic nature, they're now supporting conventional operations, they're now supporting conflict and people in the, in, in the, in the battle, and that in some ways makes them a bit more of a target, you know, because they're being used to actively pursue conventional warfare. So what are some of the trends? Um, well, there's been quite a lot of talk about how other countries, uh, primarily Russia and China, have been developing counter space capabilities. Um, in some cases, these are basically bringing back capabilities that existed during the Cold War. Um, in other cases, there's hints that there may be something new that has not necessarily been done before in a military context. It may have been thought about, but not actually done before. Um, it's hard to tell, you know, as somebody who works in the, in the public uh, open source domain, it's kind of hard to tell sometimes what exactly is going on. Uh, but there's a decent amount of evidence uh, of both Russia and China testing ground-based direct ascent and satellite systems that could be used against low Earth orbit objects. Um, that is not hugely different from threats that existed in decades past. Uh, there's other evidence suggests that there may be uh, attempts to develop capabilities that could threaten satellites in higher orbits, maybe out the geostationary orbit. That, if true, would be something that is new. Um, and I think maybe part of what's driving increased concern, particularly among the intelligence community. Um, you've seen demonstration of capabilities, uh, particularly rendezvous and proximity operations, that while not necessarily, it's uncertain whether it is specifically an anti-satellite test, they certainly could lead to the development of co-orbital capabilities in the future. Um, and there's always been significant concern about that as a potential threat. So, so what is it the U.S. has done over the last few years? Um, well, 2010, the Obama administration released its national space policy, um, and shortly thereafter, in 2011, they released the National Security Space Strategy that was co-signed by both the Director of National Intelligence and the Secretary of Defense. Um, and then that was followed by 2012 DOD space policy. Um, and all three of these documents kind of reinforced each other, uh, basically successive levels of implementation. Um, and in general, they talked about the importance of norms of behavior in space, uh, building coalitions with allies in industry, increasing the resilience of U.S. space systems, um, and being able to respond to attacks on U.S. space capabilities, perhaps in other domains. So not necessarily responding to an attack on space, but an attack on space, but perhaps responding in the air domain or the land domain or the sea domain. Uh, and then it seems like there was a significant shift around 2013, 2014. Um, which I've assessed was probably prompted by, uh, you know, Russian and Chinese counter space testing or capabilities demonstrations. Um, and, and as a result, you saw kind of a, a, a rethink of some of these issues. Um, in 2014, the government conducted what was known as the Space Strategic Portfolio Review, uh, which uh, as far as we know was finished towards the end of the summer 2014. The report's not been released, but unofficially uh, it's been talked about as kind of the findings were that the U.S. needs to do a better job identifying threats in space, being able to withstand aggressive counter space programs, and countering adversary space capabilities. 
Uh, Congress has also been gotten into the action on this. Uh, the FY15 National Defense Authorization Act um, called on the NASA space community to present a plan to deter and defeat adversary attacks in U.S. space systems, including the role of offensive space operations and active defense. The 2016 budget request reprogrammed between five and eight billion dollars over five years for space protection. Uh, in 2015, the Obama administration created the Joint Space Doctrine and Tactics Forum, which gave a way for the military community to work with the intelligence community um, on how to respond to attacks on satellites. Um, there was the creation of the Joint Interagency Combined Space Operations Center, or the JICSPOC, uh, which uh, has been uh, explained as a way to experiment with tactics that might eventually be incorporated and op uh, implemented at the JSPOC. Um, and the shifting of the role of the Secretary of the Air Force from being the executive agent for space to being what's known as the principal DOD space advisor. Uh, and to have a stronger role in uh, kind of having a, a, an opinion about the way NASA Security Space should go. Uh, and then also in 2015, the Office of Secretary of Defense released a white paper on a resilience taxonomy for space domain mission assurance, which tried to, uh, I think, put some more intellectual rigor behind terms like reconstitution, resilience, and protection um, that had been thrown about and discussed for a long time, and what role things like disaggregation and distribution might have um, in a space protection strategy. And then most recently, in April 2016, uh, the Space Symposium, General Heighton unveiled the Space Enterprise Vision, uh, although it's very hard to tell what's, in, what's part of that because as far as I know, everything, everything about it has been classified, uh, but it seems to focus quite a bit on architectures for national security space and how to, how to update those to deal with all these threats. So I, I think it's, e it's, it's easy to say that there's probably been more interest and activity on this issue within the U.S. government in the last few years uh, than certainly I've seen in the last couple of decades. Um, and al although much of it is going on internal to the U.S. government, um, and it's hard for us on the outside to kind of get a real sense of everything that's going on. And on, honestly, you know, I think everyone I've talked to has kind of criticized the efforts of the Obama administration, but perhaps for different reasons. Um, you know, those on the conservative end of the spectrum have criticized uh, the efforts as being too soft or, or not strong enough um, and of calling for things like uh, more, uh, more, uh, more deterrence through threats um, or even, you know, in Congress calling for bringing back space-based missile defense as a way to counter anti-satellite weapons in some way. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, people have, uh, uh, you know, on the more liberal part of the spectrum, there's been concern about, you know, maybe it's time to ser get, get serious about arms control and about applying some of the same governance mechanisms that were developed in the nuclear world to space. Um, and there's been a lot of concern about what it is the, the military is doing and is it really trying to deter war or is it just kind of preparing for it? Um, and as Victoria mentioned, you know, kind of the wild card in all this is the changes in the commercial world. You know, the commercial space sector is now growing at a rate that we haven't really seen in the past um, and has a potential to become kind of the lion's share of space activities. Uh, and so how does that relate or interact with what the militaries are doing, the national security community is doing in space? Um, and I wonder, you know, with all the recent focus on the potential hostile threats, what about the environmental threats that haven't gone away? Uh, you know, issues of space weather and space debris. Um, you know, there's been quite a bit of talk about those over the last decade or so. Uh, but if you actually look through the budget and you look for actual money allocated to dealing with them, uh, or changes to roles and responsibilities, uh, there's not a whole lot to go on. Um, so I'll just close by just kind of some comments on, uh, uh, personal comments on, on the current strategy. Um, I think, you know, what we know of the current strategy and its focus on kind of this mix of norms of behavior, on increasing resilience of U.S. space systems, uh, working more closely with the commercial se sector and the allies, um, I think in general those broad strokes are good. Uh, it's hard to kind of get a sense of the details because there's either not a lot of detail or the details are not publicly known. Um, I think my biggest concern is that it all seems to be focused almost entirely on what the military is doing and the national security community, um, which I think is obviously part of the solution, uh, but you have to wonder what else is going to be there to support that. 
Um, you know, in the in the, the academic world, in the military world, we talk about strategy as having a, a diplomatic component, an informational component, a military component, an economic component. Um, and I think we've seen over the last 15 years some of the limitations of a military-centric strategy that does not have good support from political or, or diplomatic initiatives that can go in and reinforce uh, what the military has done. Um, so my question is, you know, kind of, in addition to what the DOD is doing, and they're certainly doing quite a bit, and they seem to be very focused on this, what else is the U.S. government doing that's going to support those efforts and kind of give a more well-rounded strategy? Um, so I'll stop there and open any questions once we get to that part. Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you uh, surface dwellers this afternoon, and uh, <laughs> very happy to be here and see so many uh, old friends. I'd like to explicitly thank Victoria and Brian for this opportunity. And I very much uh, look forward to our discussion about this important topic as we go forward. Of course, I have to uh, foot stomp my uh, standard disclaimer that I'm not speaking on behalf of anybody and no organization would endorse these views. This is purely my personal views that I would like to uh, espouse. So, um, I would like to uh, just go back to a couple of things that Brian and uh, Victoria mentioned because uh, I think there's some really good stuff that the Department of Defense has put out recently. In particular, I would call your attention to that space domain mission assurance, mm -hmm. a resilience taxonomy piece that was uh, published in September of last year by the Office of the Secretary of Defense. So as you may be aware, one of the um, key implementation actions for the 2011 National Security Space Strategy was to develop a more comprehensive and robust definition of what this resilience thing is and how one might accomplish it. So uh, it took a while, but uh, the Department of Defense now does have such a document, and I would commend that to you. I think it's a very thoughtful piece, and I am hopeful that um, the Department will be using it as will others in their quest to improve the mission assurance of our space systems. So uh, that's one. Uh, second, I'll just really uh, emphasize uh, a couple things that Brian said. I, I thought his introductory comments were uh, brilliant. And um, uh, I think you could find no better illustration of the fact that um, our senior leaders find this of great importance than to consider that Deputy Secretary Work spent two days down at the Schriever War Games at um, Maxwell Air Force Base. During that time, he met with senior leaders from all the participating states. So there's just no question that this is very high on the agenda and in the minds of our senior leaders, and there are probably some pretty good reasons for that. Um, and a final thing I would just like to foot stomp again, based on what Brian mentioned, is that um, while it is probably true that the Department of Defense has moved out finally on a lot of areas, the area that, uh, in my judgment, is really lacking is the rest of those uh, dime components, so the diplomatic, informational, and economic pieces that probably are at least as important as the military dimension of this problem. And in my humble opinion, the United States government does not have a good process for integrating those things and ensuring that they are um, comprehensively part of the mix when trying to address any of these um, mission assurance challenges that we face. So really, there's just two things I'd like to um, put stomp. I mean, as you probably um, gather, I am a big fan of the NSSS. I think it's a um, really significant document. I would not advocate that we need a new one at this uh, juncture. I think it's striking the right tone, and it is a permissive, general, comprehensive policy that, or strategy that um, enables a lot of other activity. I would call your attention to, though, that um, the difference between the 2010 National Space Policy and the 2011 National Security Space Strategy is significant. And the thing that I can't discuss <laughs> that's even more dis significant is where the United States government has gone since the 2011 National Security Space Strategy. Um, but what I would in particular call your attention to is, if you think of where President Obama was when he came into office and what he was trying to do with his 2010 National Space Policy versus where we are today. Or think of it in terms of Secretary Carter. Uh, 
when Secretary Carter came into uh, the government working for the Office of Technology Assessment for Congress back in the 1980s, it would have been very hard to find any military or strategic defense system that he was a big fan of. Today, it's extremely hard to find any space system in particular that he isn't a big fan of. In fact, if you want to point to one individual that is really driving this train in the most significant fashion, it is one each, Honorable Ashton B. Carter. So I will just stop that for you. Um, OK, so my two things, uh, what, what do we need to do differently and better? We need more transparency, OK? I can't talk about this stuff. It's highly significant. <laughs> the United States government has done a lot of good stuff, but for whatever reasons, it has chosen not to make those public. So I understand uh, sources and methods. I had the pl privilege of working at the uh, Office of the Director of National Intelligence for three years. I think I understand that a lot. Um, we don't want to give away sources and methods of obtaining information. Uh, I understand the concerns about not um, uh, incentivizing other states to develop counter space capabilities. So in particular, we don't want to give the Indians, for example, uh, any additional reasons to develop those kind of capabilities. But folks, let's face it. That ship has sailed about 20 or 30 years ago. Okay. So we're kidding ourselves when we say, oh, we don't want to create incentives for them to do this. They've already done it. So the idea that we're somehow imposing constraint by what we say about it is really kind of silly. And um, I'm not saying there's no utility to that, but let's think this through a little bit more carefully here, folks. And in particular, if the Obama administration, and, and it is a settled policy on the part of the Obama administration that we're going to go forward with a significant shift in the way we approach state security. But if they want to make that an enduring and sustainable policy shift, guess what? They're going to have to talk about it more because playing this trust me card over and over gets old, particularly with Congress and the American public or international publics. So, um, that's my number one thing that the United States government needs to work on is transparency. Fortunately, that uh, Secretary Carter I mentioned before, he has publicly said that he believes much of what the United States does in space or what it talks about in space is overclassified. So there is an ongoing effort on the part of the Department of Defense and the intelligence community to review many of those classification restrictions and to be able to talk about this more. As someone in the trenches trying to do that, <laughs> I can tell you that it is extremely difficult because of the fault position of all government agencies with respect to those type of issues is that it's going to stay the same. And how dare you even bring that up? And then they <laughs> should. So it's, it's very difficult. But that really needs to be done. And that's my number one thing. Um, OK, so second thing, uh, just real briefly. Um, how can we incentivize, how can the United States government incentivize uh, all those commercial things that we, we would like to see more of? So largely that devolves to an issue of um, regulation and licensing of those activities, as well as the government's responsibilities under the Outer Space Treaty to have uh, continuing supervision over those activities. So in that regard, I would suggest that the United States government needs to do a kind of zero-based review of its base, basic policies and strategies towards commercial activity in space. Uh, as you know, the Outer Space Treaty was written in 1967. Commercial activities were not really even an afterthought in that, given the state of commercial activity at the time. So if there's anything that needs to be advanced in uh, respect to uh, international space law and domestic uh, legal uh, regulation and um, So how does this manifest itself? Well, um, almost anything commercial entities want to do in space uh, is looked at skeptically from the position of the United States government because they don't really have well-developed and comprehensive policies to regulate it or license it. So that's what I'm really suggesting is the United States government needs to do a fundamental reevaluation of those, think through its um, basic goals. Uh, one of which I would strongly recommend is to incentivize growth in this industry. Uh, the more of this that is done by the United States, the better it is for us in building that uh, more resilient uh, architecture that can ensure.
Just one other specific thing I can raise with respect to that is um, many things that commercial actors are interested in doing, uh, there just basically is no process for regulating or licensing that. And the bad news is the U.S. is the world's leader in licensing and regulating things. So it's a difficult challenge. And um, again, the U.S. government needs to think more broadly and uh, creatively about that. We can't keep treating everything like it's a remote sensing system. <laughs> so if you want to do on-orbit servicing, that's remote sensing. If you want to do um, rendezvous and proximity operations, remote sensing. Uh, maybe uh, debris removal, remote sensing. Um, so you get the picture. So um, again, w the government needs to think more creatively and uh, comprehensively about that and think through what it is that it's trying to accomplish and hopefully, in the fullness of time, create some policies that could actually incentivize growth and more consistency and predictability uh, on the part of industry in them wanting to take on investments in this area. So I very much look forward to our uh, discussion here in a few minutes. Thank you. Uh, I'm Todd Harrison, a uh, senior fellow with the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And I want to thank both Brian and Victoria uh, for having us here today for this great discussion. Uh, so I, I'll start by disagreeing a little with uh, what Peter said, only on one point. Uh, I think it is time uh, to update the National Security Space Strategy, probably in about a year when we've got a new administration in, in office. Uh, and it's not that I think that there's anything so bad with the current uh, NSSS. <laughs> uh, too many S's. Um, it, it's not that there's anything that bad with it. I think it's actually pretty good, uh, but I think we can make it even better. And as times change, we just need to update things. And so uh, I've got three basic areas uh, that I think uh, where we could improve on the existing space strategy. Uh, number one uh, is I think we actually need to give NASA a greater role. Uh, maybe I should rephrase that. We need to give NASA a role. Uh, if you look in the, in the current National Security Space Strategy, it never mentions NASA by name. Uh, you know, why is that? Uh, now, we don't normally think of NASA uh, as being national security related, uh, but I think NASA actually could be an important part of our space strategy uh, because we can use NASA to engage with some non-traditional partners, nations that might even be military competitors. Uh, why would we want to do this? Well, number one, to increase transparency. Uh, so we can have a better idea of what they're doing if we're engaged with them. And you know what? Transparency works both ways. Uh, they would also have a better idea of what our intentions are in space. Uh, and I think that can only be a good thing and to our advantage. Uh, and the second reason is we want to encourage norms of conduct or norms of behavior in space. Uh, and NASA is a perfect place to do that. Uh, the current space strategy says we should lead by example. I think NASA is probably the best example we have uh, for the world uh, in how we intend to use space peacefully. Um, <clears throat> and you know, final point here on NASA, um, you know, we talk about the diplomatic component to our strategy. Uh, I think we ought to explicitly give that role to NASA. Uh, because NASA has a vast network of international partnerships, uh, and it is a source of national power. Who doesn't want to work with NASA? NASA has a great brand image uh, around the world, uh, and so our space strategy should leverage that. Um, second thing I think it could be improved uh, in the current space strategy is how uh, it addresses commercial industry and how that's going to fit into our space strategy. Uh, so specifically, I think it ought to include a sourcing strategy uh, as part of the overall space strategy. So what I mean by that is thinking through uh, what is it we need from industry and what kind of U.S. industry do we want to create uh, and help foster. I shouldn't actually say create because we're not in the business of creating this industry anymore. Uh, what do we want to encourage and what do we want to foster uh, in the U.S. space industry? Uh, you know, a good example would be, I think it's in our, our national security strategic uh, interest to have more than one launch vehicle for military launches from more than one company. Uh, why not say that? Uh, why not be specific about that, that that's part of our strategy? 
and yeah, <laughs> and then follow through on it uh, as well. Oh, uh, now you're talking crazy. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, <laughs> uh, and we should also, this gets a little more difficult, but we should also address when we want to buy things as a service and buy them as a product. And that is changing. Uh, I think it has changed since 2011. Um, for things that aren't unique to the military, uh, for things where there is a roughly equivalent commercial market, uh, we ought to be seriously looking more and more at buying things as a service. So here I'm thinking of launch, SATCOM, um, you know, imagery, some types of imagery, some types of SATCOM, not all, uh, weather information. There are a lot of things that we could be buying as a service rather than trying to build and launch and operate our own satellites for these things. I think we're already headed in that direction, uh, but I think that should be incorporated into our space strategy. Final area I think uh, that needs some more improvement, and I, I will be the first to admit I don't have the answers here, uh, is we need to address in more explicit detail uh, how we think about escalation and deterrence in space. Uh, specifically, how are we going to manage escalation? Uh, you know, uh, we like to compare deterrence in space with nuclear deterrence. I think on one level that works really great uh, in the sense that just like with nuclear weapons, we have to find a stable deterrence posture uh, because you know, the use of nuclear weapons is just not acceptable. We don't want to see that in the world ever. Uh, so we've got to you know, have a stable deterrence posture there. I think the same is true when it comes to kinetic ASAT weapons in space. It's just not acceptable to see them being used. We don't want to be in a position where they are used. Uh, I'm afraid, though, that we're at our current uh, situation is not stable. We don't have a stable deterrent posture in space when it comes to kinetic weapons, uh, but we've got to get there. I think anything less is, is just simply unacceptable. Um, right now, I think the space strategy, and part of this I'm sure is due to classification issues, uh, it doesn't say a lot in terms of specifics. It says that basically uh, we want to work to discourage bad things uh, and we want to encourage good behavior uh, and we want to do that by working with our partners. Uh, well, that's, that's great, but strategy is about ends, ways, and means. Uh, we've got the ends. We know what we want in terms of the end space here, uh, but we need more details on the ways and the means. How are we going to do it? It needs to be in enough detail uh, that DOD can craft clear and unclassified rules of engagement for space. Uh, now, there can also be classified version, that's fine. Uh, but I say a clear, unclassified uh, set of rules of engagement for space because it's a way of communicating to other people. Uh, that's how we can set up a space deterrence posture uh, that might actually work. Of course, a, a key part of deterrence is making sure that potential adversaries know what actions will trigger a response, what range of consequences there might be, uh, and those consequences actually have to be credible. Uh, and so we've got to think through that. And again, I don't have the answers here, uh, but that's what we need to do uh, if we want to get to that goal of a stable deterrence posture in space. I think right now, uh, the way we would respond, the things that would trigger a response, they're just not clear. Uh, and it's leading to a situation where we've got a dangerous kind of Wild West mentality in space uh, where people are willing to try things just to see what will happen. Uh, and, and that's not where we want to be. We need to move past that. And so I think uh, an update to the space strategy uh, will help get us to where we need to be. Thank you. Uh, John Sheldon, I'm the uh, chairman of Thor Group and also the publisher of Spacewatch Middle East. Um, my disclaimer, uh, I'm, these are my own views that don't represent the views of my company, uh, nor of our clients past and uh, uh, present. Uh, but uh, what I agree with, with my fellow panelists, and there's so much here that I will uh, uh, stray away from, but uh, I also, uh, my, my remarks are going to conclude with the basic fact I at least understand it. Strategy. I'm not saying it's a bad document. I'm not saying it's necessarily a harmful document. I'm just saying if it didn't exist, it wouldn't necessarily matter uh, in terms of how uh, the current administration is approaching these things. First off, on context, I agree with pretty much everything that uh, my, uh, uh, my fellow panelists have said, except to say also we should add to the context that 
current uh, drive by the administration to uh, develop a response to these uh, perceived threats to space systems isn't necessarily just an institutional response. It comes actually from the man at the top himself, the president. Uh, uh, the uh, understanding is, is that uh, the president uh, was uh, uh, a consumer of a certain amount of intelligence where it became clear actually questioned the uh, Joint Chiefs on this uh, in person uh, to the point whereby they hadn't really thought about it and he encouraged them to think about it. And essentially what we're seeing now is, uh, at least from an administration's point of view, the culmination of that personal interest. And the President himself, it's my understanding, has taken an interest in the redevelopment of this policy. Why is that important? Well, it's important because, and you might gather from my accent, I'm from central Alabama and, you know, I don't really... <laughs> But as, a, as, a, as someone who is essentially politically neutral here in the U.S., uh, I'm a British conservative, so I'm not really sure these days what that makes me in the U.S. Uh, but uh, the, uh, I'm, I'm a small C conservative at that, but uh, they're probably an old blue dog Democrat, I guess. I don't know. But, uh, but one thing I will say is this, is that, you know, if you, as a student of American politics since uh, I was in my late teens, having taught, may I add, U.S. government in Alabama, hence the Alabama joke, uh, where they thought I was from Vermont. That's not a joke, they really did. Uh, I'd like to say I'm not an expert on, on, on American government and constitution, but at least I, I, th I like to think I understand it. Uh, but what I do understand about American politics are the third rails of American politics. Every country has their third rails in politics. I understand American third rails in politics. There are the cultural wars and all these sort of things. But let's, let's be clear. Uh, when it comes to things to do with military space, it's traditionally been a Republican domain. Uh, and it's usually been lumped together with family values and all these kind of things. In other words, uh, if you believe in the family values, you obviously believe in Star Wars, Death Stars, and all these kind of things. I'm talking in broad terms. Uh, it's all nonsense, of course. And if you're a Democrat, uh, it was, you know, peace in space and never the twain shall meet. The reality, of course, was far much more complex. Uh, but that's always how it's been presented politically. So the reason why it's important that President Obama himself has taken a personal interest in this and has driven this policy through this personal but here you have, in every other respect, a progressive Democrat actually changing the status quo politically in that third rail aspect by actually pushing the, uh, the U.S. towards this much more uh, engaged uh, 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 approach to national security space. It, it doesn't necessarily fall within the norm of what you might expect from a progressive Democrat. And I think that's important. That's actually significant. And may I also add, it's also been noticed in other words, if a Republican administration were to do this, well, they would do that, wouldn't they? So for a Democrat like President Obama to do that, that actually is quite significant. And also, I think that that's also part of this narrative you're hearing from some quarters, primarily from the liberal quarters, which is, you know, it varies from, oh, they're being captured by the, uh, you know, the military-industrial complex or anything like that. I find those sort of arguments uh, rather old-fashioned. Uh, they're very minor. away from this is that President Obama's interest actually signifies that maybe there's something to this idea that there are threats out there. Now, in some cases, I believe some of the threats are taken out of context or maybe even uh, overhyped, particularly the Russian threat, uh, which at the moment is primarily electronic. Uh, the China threat, I think, is more substantial. Uh, but we need to keep this context in mind. There are problems, of course, with the national security space strategy as it's currently constituted. Diplomatic emphasis, which is actually the very first point that the NSSS uh, uh, discusses, is nowhere to be found right now. The, uh, uh, using the EU code of conduct uh, as a uh, means of transforming norms in space has collapsed, unfortunately. Uh, the, uh, there is no counter right now to the, US, sorry, the Russian and Chinese proposal for the Prevention of Placement of Weapons in Space uh, Treaty. Uh, if you attend any kind of track two or track one or track 1.5 international event in space security, you'll find that the Russians and the Chinese have made great inroads with third party countries in terms of their interest in a PPWT approach. Um, and we haven't necessarily been good. When I say we, not just the United States, but also our European partners, as well as Japan and Australia, in actually promoting at least having a, a united front on promoting the code of conduct. Uh, there's plenty of blame to go around, uh, but uh, no secret now that the State Department is uh, walking away from the Code of Conduct. It's uh, it basically exhausted itself. So the question becomes, so what's next? And whoever wins the election in November,
confident that one party uh, will address it in an adequate manner, and that's not a criticism of, of the candidates uh, of that particular party, who I have plenty of criticism of on a personal point of view, but that that particular party has, for the past several decades, had a rather unfortunate view, a rather dim view, of how diplomacy works and how it should be integrated with the military aspect as well. Um, and I'm not confident that that party has moved to a position where it can recognize that. And I agree with what Pete said, whereby there has been a disconnect between the diplomatic and the military. I come from a government culture. I used to work for the British Foreign Office, where there was very close liaison between the British Foreign Office variety of issues where it wasn't diplomacy versus military, both were on the same spectrum. You know? uh, and I don't see much evidence of that happening here in the United States right now. That's not a particular administration's point of view uh, problem uh, or fault. That's unfortunately a cultural problem that's uh, uh, arrived that's in the... Uh, that's, uh, that, that's the effects my talking has. <laughs> Uh, I'm actually a secret <laughs> cyber warfare. Where we we space, <laughs> space to turn it on. I can't even read my own notes right now. <laughs> Ooh. There we go. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so without this larger diplomatic strategy right now, uh, the U.S. is left to basically doing bilateral discussions, which are all very good. Uh, in fact, uh, Frank Rose announced that uh, he'll be doing discussions, for example, not just with our traditional European allies, Japan and Australia, discussions that have been ongoing for quite some time, but also with uh, our other friends as well around the world, including, for example, uh, the GCC, primarily the United Arab Emirates and uh, Saudi Arabia. In the coming months, we would have signed an SSA agreement with the UAE as well. Uh, this is all good stuff. Um, we're probably going to find that uh, more of these friendly governments uh, understand where they're coming from, especially as these uh, governments like UAE become major space powers themselves, at least regionally. So international partners, here's the other aspect. Well, we're doing good on the bilateral aspect of uh, uh, discussing with partners. Uh, as Doug Levero and OSD has pointed out, we do have a slight policy problem whereby, yes, it's good to get international partners involved and uh, even trying to get some sort of interoperability between systems, especially in comms and uh, remote sensing and so on. Uh, but we have a particular problem, which is... There is a fear that by it cooperating with the United States, you become entangled with fights that the United States uh, gets involved with that you, as a particular country, do not necessarily want to become uh, embroiled with. So, for, for example, think of the uh, current crisis we're seeing right now in the South China Sea. The U.S. is doing freedom of navigation operations. All very good. I personally agree with that. Uh, but let's say we have agreements where we can use French or German satellites in the event of an emergency. Uh, how does France and Germany feel about becoming embroiled? standoff in the South China Sea with China when we're using French or German remote sensing capabilities uh, or even communication between the British and our operating Skynet in the region, for example. Uh, when you look at, for example, those countries' foreign policies towards China, uh, it's not necessarily as uh, hawkish as ours is, uh, or at least not necessarily as uh, 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 engaged as ours is, and uh, there's also a much more, uh, uh, how should I put this politely? A much more nuanced approach to our position in freedom of navigation in the, uh, the region. In other words, it's an argument that many people in Europe would rather stay out of. Uh, and by using satellites uh, from those countries in that particular situation, I'm using that situation as an example, could become problematic. And Doug Levera is quite rightly asked for, we need some sort of, not just policy clarification from the US side, there needs to be a much more detailed discussion with potential partners about, okay, where would you not want us to use your satellites? And oh, by, by the way, vice versa. You know, uh, these countries also use U.S. satellites. Where is it you don't want them using U.S. satellites as much as uh, they don't uh, uh, want us using their satellites? So we need to think more about that. Uh, deterrence. Uh, I have a slightly different take on this than Todd. Todd's right, of course. There needs to be a more clearer discussion and at least understanding of what there is uh, in terms of escalation and, and so on. But uh, I think also, though, that in a wider sense, not just in terms of space, In terms of how you achieve deterrence, or at least you create the, the, the fertile ground for deterrence success, uh, is a lot more complex than I think many, uh, at least senior officials led by the regime at DOD. Uh, this idea of a multi-layered approach to deterrence, for example, 
but, uh, <laughs> they read it and Confusion. They, yeah uh, let me let me give you an example and it's not necessary to say that what i used to do for a living was the same as trying to deter people from attacking our space stations but i used to be a nightclub bouncer in glasgow in the end of the day uh, and i used to use my bouncing uh, stories all the time and i haven't done it for a while but i will in this sense when I dealt with some bad guys, and believe me, I dealt with some pretty bad guys, there was one guy called Ivor Levine. He ran a protection racket in Edinburgh. Um, and his way of dealing with anybody who didn't pay up was to basically attack them with a pickaxe. Um, he was actually eventually arrested for attempted murder uh, with a pickaxe. He's a seriously bad dude. And I had some run-ins with this guy. What I, when I had run-ins with this guy, um, what I didn't say is, Ivor, I'm going to deter you. I will find ways of deterring you from doing bad things. No, I basically, and I'll not use the salty language I used at the time, but basically said, I'm going to find ways of messing you up. And I did. I did it at great risk. And that's the problem. Okay, so when we're dealing with, for example, deterring attacks against space systems, there are two ways we're going to do that. We're going to do it whereby it's going to be a waste of effort for the adversary because we achieve a certain amount of protection and resiliency, which I think should be our priority for the time being. And then if that fails, we're going to mess not going to go around, well, at least I would argue we shouldn't go around saying, we're going to deter you. What does that mean? You're just telling me that, you know, well, we're going to do bad things to you. Show me. Where's the credibility? And this is going to be very controversial because that means, yes, there should be uh, an approach whereby, from a military perspective, we can at least demonstrate capability whereby we can say, if bad things happen, this is how we're going to achieve it. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen in space. I'm not talking about space have the means whereby we can achieve certain objectives militarily, and by the way, we can do so in an assured manner, uh, that would eventually, hopefully, deter an adversary. Here's the other thing. We could also all do all these things and still not deter an adversary. We talk about deterrence in the DOD as if somehow by merely saying it, the adversary is deterred. It's a psychological relationship we're trying to enter here. We're trying to threaten somebody. That's what deterrence is, by the way. I'm a euphemism in of itself like collateral damage. No, deterrence is about threatening violence. And if you're going to threaten violence, you at least have to be credible. I was bigger than Ivor Levine. I could threaten violence. He walked away thinking, maybe he could mess me up. Or words to that effect. And I'm not sure we're necessarily doing that. So I, I get the impression when I speak with officials that deterrence is, well, times are tight in terms of the budget. We'll talk about deterrence because that somehow Actually, I've, I've heard this, uh, and I think I suspect many of you have also heard this same thing. And I'm sorry, I don't understand that. And I'm not saying I'm the smartest guy in the room, but I worked hard for my PhD and, and so on. And you know, again, it's like dealing with uh, Air Force students used to present their findings for their thesis in PowerPoint, and I would say to them, "Sorry, I have a PhD. I don't understand a word of that. Please go back and do it again. At least go back and do this again. At least do that again." So it's not only defining where the escalation ladder is and what we would be prepared to do and not do, but also we need to get a better understanding of what it means to deter. Um, and that's not just in space, because as has been pointed out, or at least been intimated here, we are so integrated now in space in terms of our conventional war fighting capabilities, land, sea, and air, and cyber, uh, that deterrence is going to be much more than what we do in and from space. It's going to be done in a much more holistic manner. And I don't think we necessarily have gotten a better handle on that right now uh, than we should. Uh, I would also argue that uh, we're not necessarily prepared to deal with the greater transparency, reg uh, the, the transparency regime that we're going to find happening in space, especially when we have one arm of the US government talking very openly about having a, a Federal Aviation Authority approach to space traffic management, versus a military culture that still will not even acknowledge particular systems, for example, even though everybody knows they exist and so on. Uh, so we're not prepared for that transparency regime that is going to happen uh, in the coming decade and beyond. Uh, national security culture, and Pete's al al alluded to this, and I've come across it in my experience as well. Uh, by the way, I used to work for the US Air Force. I'm not sure that's uh, been made clear. So I do have some knowledge of what I'm talking about here. Uh, but we still have a national security culture where uh, any uh, 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 That. And also a culture, especially in the national security space uh, establishment right now, uh, in the more mid management level, that looks at commercial space as some sort of lesser than. Uh, whereas if you look at the current state of commercial space capability, 
Hey, Sears pointed out uh, uh, with Intel SAP, when I'm uh, broadcasting the, uh, the Super Bowl uh, and everything's riding on my satellites being able to broadcast that Super Bowl, So we still come across that, uh, uh, that problem. And then lastly, uh, there still has to be this debate. It's happening in an osmotic way, but not necessarily in, a, in a, uh, an express uh, or at least explicit way, which is what role must the government, and by that I also include uh, uh, the military and NASA, what role must the government absolutely play in space? What is it they absolutely have to do that no one else can or should do? So for example, from a military perspective, I personally believe only the U.S. Air Force can provide ballistic missile early warning satellites. Uh, it's a, a, if you will, a fundamental responsibility of the U.S. Air Force and so on. But uh, let's have a debate here. Does the Air Force really need its own weather satellites? Really? I mean, I've heard the arguments for why, but I'm still not convinced that we need to spend, actually blow the money that we've been blowing on it uh, for what can only be a marginal capability at best. So we're still not having that explicit debate. What is it that the U.S. government must absolutely do, and then what can be left to the commercial sector beyond that? So we're still having those debates. Why is it not a strategy? Well, my definition of strategy, strategy is the art and science of basically taking policy intent done by the politicians and making it into something that is technical, military, feasible. Uh, it's not expressed in a document. If it's a document, it's a snapshot of a particular all the instruments you have at your disposal from a strategic point of view change every day. It's a dynamic uh, uh, approach. So, for example, uh, the NSSS uh, articulates that diplomacy is a very important aspect towards this, and yet let's see what's, you know, we have to look what's happening on the diplomatic side. Uh, not necessarily from the fault of the US, but the diplomatic side is found wanting. Uh, what you really need, uh, basically, a much more coordinated approach to how we do strategy. Strategy is an action, it's not a Much more, find a much more coordinated approach to do this, uh, but of course the U.S. system, as it's currently constituted, uh, is not necessarily congenial to that kind of uh, approach. Uh, it never really has been unless there's a dire national security emergency. So I'm afraid in the end we're just going to do what we, the British, do, which is to muddle through, keep calm, carry on. Or maybe not keep calm, but we'll carry on. So I hate to be the the buzzkill, but uh, I'm 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 not I'm not terribly. Uh, uh, strategy, no matter how good it is at the time, is going to be of any real benefit in the long term. It's a question of what we do in the day to day. I'll leave it there. Thank you. <laughs> okay, before I open up for questions, I had a few, um, I want to get thoughts of the panelists and some issues that were raised during the, the talk. Um, first, I'd like to pull on something that John brought up at the beginning, where you talked about how the current response to the US government is largely being driven from the top. Um, whether or not you agree with that, that brings up an issue. Of course, there's an election coming up. What do you guys think is going to be happening in terms of where are we going from here? Will there be a big change, or is this a shift that does not turn on a dime and it's moving ahead and nothing's not going to be slowed down? Um, I ask because we're having internal discussions, which Brian will probably bring up. <laughs> we don't know. Um, so I'm curious to hear what you guys think about that. Yeah, so I, I have a copy of the Trump uh, space strategy, if anyone. Oh, just kidding. Um, <laughs> Believe me, it's going to be great. <laughs> yeah, right. We're going to win yeah, in space. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's unbelievable. It's going to be the best space strategy ever. But <laughs> beyond platitudes, uh, you know, we're not, this isn't going to be an election issue, really. Uh, unless something, you know, unthinkable were to happen between now and November. Um, it's probably not going to be discussed at all. Uh, there'll probably be some thought put to it during the transition, uh, but I imagine it will be this time next year before uh, the new team really gets any kind of uh, any kind of traction uh, going uh, and thinking about space strategy. And it is, is always pretty safe to say uh, on these things uh, that we will see more continuity than change, uh, regardless of who wins. Um, you know, that, that has been the tradition when it comes to defense strategy is, you know, even when
uh, on vastly different uh, defense strategies. Uh, when it comes to governing, uh, there is often much more continuity than change. So, uh, you know, without being able to say anything specific, because no one's really saying anything about it in the campaign, uh, I wouldn't expect any kind of huge abrupt changes uh, with the next administration. I agree. Um Well, I would add that uh, word on the street is if you're a, uh, part of the Trump team, you're having a very hard time right now recruiting any kind of defense or foreign policy expert into your uh, platform to, and that includes space experts. Uh, so, um, you know, it depends on who that transition team is and who they're made up of. So, uh, but certainly, I, my gut tells me whether it's Hillary or... Sanders were to somehow find a way of uh, defeating Hillary Clinton and actually getting the uh, Democratic no nomination, I think we're going to see a much more uh, different kind of space policy, but there's nothing on his campaign literature that can uh, point to where he sees it. Um, I can't really add anything with respect to the likely uh, candidates, but what I can say is um, it's amazing to me that this administration has at some level chosen to make space security. I can't talk about is extremely detailed and specific. So it's a decade-long program to get well in space. And um, uh, if it's implemented, uh, it, it will certainly uh, be a major turn in American uh, space security uh, policy. So uh, uh, to me, that's really the big news. I, I don't know whether the next administration will implement it, but certainly the Obama administration is trying to set in. So I, I'll agree with the theme of you know more continuity than than, than change. I, I will just add that I would I would hope to see a renewed focus on something that came up a couple times, which is kind of a, a broader look at space policy in general. Um, there's you know a lot of the stuff we can talk about now is kind of focused on national security side, and there's certainly been much more focus on national security policy, and there's usually a little bit of focus on what NASA does. Um, but I I would hope that whoever the next administration is kind of takes a step back and does what a couple have talked about and kind of look more holistically at space policy across the board, uh, which I don't think has really been done a lot. Uh, and I would like to see that because I, it's, you know, we, we all use it much more now than ever before. The military uses it more, the commercial sector is getting more involved into it, society relies on it much more. Um, I, I think it deserves a more holistic attention uh, from a public policy standpoint than what most administrations have given to it in the past. Um, but I'm not sure if that'll actually happen or not. And then a couple, everyone brought up the idea of bringing in the commercial players. Um, my question is how, I know we said we don't want to drive industry, but is there a way in which, I mean, you say, okay, we're going to make, we're going to provide so that RPO activities can be done in a non-threatening manner, or how is that going to go about doing this? Well, um, I'll say two things that I can think good place to start. One. And, and, and Pete hinted at that, is that there's not a lot of certainty right now. If you are a commercial company or looking to become a commercial company and you want to do something that is, doesn't fit easily into a pre-existing box, right? If, if you're going to go build a satellite to take visible imagery, there's a pretty nice box that you can then go get all your licenses and, and go do. But if you're doing something that doesn't fit nicely into that spot, that box, like you're going to take imagery outside of the visible spectrum, or you're going to do other kinds of remote sensing, um, or you're going to do something that's not remote sensing, uh, there's not a well-defined process. Uh, and that is, in my mind, a, a big disincentive, and it's a, it is a cost of business, and it's, it's deterring some of the innovation that I think could be happening. Um, so I think be, you know, having a more clear process for how a wide range of commercial activities could be done uh, is, is a big part of it. The other one I'll mention is the default right now, you know, somebody characterized it as, you know, we basically say no slowly. And, <laughs> and, and that's like the worst of all worlds, right? Um, I, 
you know, the, 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 the instinct is if it's something new, particularly if it's something that the DOD likes to call its own or likes to do itself, the default is no. Um, and I would prefer a system that kind of changes that around, and the default is yes, uh, on, with this certain exceptions. Um, there's always going to be exceptions. So I would just say those are the two ways I would say to address that. The part you left out, Brian, is we, it's no, but we can't tell you why. Well, okay, yes, yeah, no slowly, and right, we can't tell right, you why. Right. Okay, so um, you know what I would really uh, recommend uh, along the lines of what uh, the panelists have said is, um, you know, if the U.S. government could just come up with a list of what it thinks it has to do in space, that there's really no commercial market or, or it's some inherently governmental activity that must be done by only the United States government for our national security. If we could come up with a great list like that, I think a lot of these other things are going to sort out. I don't recommend it's um, the business of the United States government to kind of pick winners and losers in terms of what is and isn't going to be commercially viable. But if we can just say these things are going to be done for the uh, foreseeable future by the United States government because it has to be done by the government and it's important to our security, then everything else really could be opened up to commercial uh, activity. And some of those things will be commercially viable, some won't. But again, if the U.S. creates a predictable, stable environment with respect to that, it creates um, better prospects for those things becoming commercially viable and uh, enduring things that can enhance our uh, future assurance. I mean, I think one thing DOD could do to help industry um, is provide a little, a better forecast uh, and, and be more reliable in terms of demand of what it will want in the future. Um, you know, it can't just say, geez, you know, I, I wish we could lease more commercial transponders for SATCOM uh, in the frequency bands that we already use. Um, and then a company like, I think it was XSTAR comes along uh, with X-band satellite and then they don't buy it. Um, you know, that, that reverberates throughout the market. And then now everyone else is going to say, geez, even if they say they on it. I'm not sure that they really will follow through on it. Uh, and it's not just in SATCOM, it's in things like imagery, weather. Um, there are a lot of things that if, you know, as Pete was saying, if you could just put together the list of here are the things the military is going to do itself for, you know, whatever reasons. And then here are the other things that w we are willing to go out and contract with other people to do and the terms in which we're willing to do it. Long-term leases, buying things as a service, you know, you know FAR Part 12 versus Part 15, you know, Put it out there and then follow through on it in the future. You know, you, don't necessarily, you can't necessarily control how much money you're going to have, but you can control your acquisition strategy. Uh, and so I think DOD could be a better customer uh, in that respect. And, and just to follow up on that, we're seeing, for example, that Secretary Carson has uh, set up offices in Silicon Valley and rather than uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, where tobacco is more likely, uh, to try and get these small, nimble, innovative companies to uh, you know, start looking at the DOD. And, that's based on the experience, of course, where if you are a small company, uh, an unfortunate experience here, um, you, know, you want to help, so you want to you know, help your country, and, and you know, my person is a doctor of country, uh, and then you go to you know, contracting with the DOD, and, and you think, you know, this, it, there is no seven rings of hell, there is actually eight. You know, we're in, we are in the eighth ring of hell. Have some intractable problems here as well. Maybe I'm being the older European and just you know, raining on the American optimism here, but, uh, but that's how I see it. <laughs> I had one thing to that that it made me think of it, and I completely agree. Um, there's another aspect of this outreach to Silicon Valley, and let's just expand it, you know, more generally. 
innovative uh, sectors um, that have traditionally not participated in defense, um, in that you, you got to be concerned about something. And, and the defense industry, there's a common saying that, you know, over time you start to mirror your customer. And that is true in many of our big defense primes. Uh, if you look at the way they're structured, you look at the way they're managed, you look at the way they operate, it mirrors the what they're seeing on the acquisition side of the U.S. military, uh, and that's not good. Uh, and that's that's what has led us at this point where we don't see a lot of innovation coming out of industry because we don't have it within our own uh, you know structure within the military. I, the danger here is if we're successful at actually reaching out to these small startups in Silicon Valley, we could ruin them <laughs> because they could start mirroring us again. So before we do that, uh, we need to get our own house in order and we need to reform you know, the personnel system within the military. Uh, I'm talking the military personnel system and the civil service system. We need to reform that so it is a culture that actually fosters and welcomes innovation. Uh, and that is a hard task, but I think we've got to get the, the, you know, our house, our internal house in order before we go out and, and expect to, you know, engage effectively with these smaller, innovative startup firms. Bad here. You should see the other guy. They're even worse. So actually, we're okay. That note, uh, maybe I should open this up to questions from the audience since we're getting. Oh, I'm looking here. Uh, starting up front, if you guys could just, uh, a wait for the mic. B, please identify yourself and your affiliation. Thank you. Hi, I'm Teresa Hitchens, and I'm a senior research scholar at the Center for International Security Studies at the University of Maryland. And I have a a, a, a macro question in a way. One of the serious problems that seems to have affected. Um, national space, national security space policy and strategy for many years is the disconnect, and that is putting it politely, between the black community and the white community in space. And this, if you follow, you know, reform measures, the creation of NSSO, the uncreation of NSSO, the, you know, um, Things are together with Stratcom. They're not together with Stratcom. There have been recently this new, you know, assignment of the Air Force Secretary. Um, we've seen all these permutations in structure that seem to be designed to somehow overcome these barriers, and they never seem to do so. The Jixbuck is the is the latest one, but you know that disconnect is it. If you follow this stuff, a lot of what happens in policy is actually what happens in process. And if the process is broken, then we have a problem in implementing the policy. So I would like to ask the panel, do you think that there have been changes or that the culture is starting to change or that there's hope for this? Because I don't see a strategy that includes engagement, for example, with commercial partners and allied partners. Right now, SSA is a big question. I don't see that engagement strategy working if you can't get over the the problems that you have there. So I'll I'll start. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily characterize it as a problem between uh, unclassified white and classified black. I would say that there are long-standing uh, differences between the military space community and the intelligence space community, and that's not just in the space world. And that happens kind of more broadly in general. Um, I think I think you have seen I think I have seen a fundamental change in the last couple of years towards starting to close that gap. Um, I mean, I I personally lived through the creation of the JSPOC, um, and and you know, frankly, the intel community didn't come play. Right? It ended up being just the military doing its military command and control. Uh, but that has changed, and with the the the, the joint tactics forum that I mentioned and the JSPOC. I think you've, uh, we've seen at least externally more evidence that the intel community is suddenly concerned or more concerned about these issues and is trying to engage more with the military community, um, and which may then lead to a more coherent cooperation between the two. Uh, but there are still challenges, and, and one of them might be, for example, legal challenges, right? They operate under different authorities within the U.S. Code. And there are things the intel community can do that the military can't do and vice versa. And, and so that's a real difficult issue to work through. Um, 
and I'm not sure how to resolve that, but I think at least as, as institutions, there is more, at least more willingness to kind of work together and collaborate than I've seen in the past. Well, I appreciate your question, and it's certainly near and dear to my heart. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely biased on this, but um, I believe the uh, PDSA structure has as good a chance to be uh, successful as any other um, structure that we've tried. Um, and it's interesting because right before I came here, I received the um, draft copy of a GAO report that um, kind of takes the opposite position. So, um, you know, this is a continuing churn in the government, and there is no optimal way to organize these things. So, uh, in my opinion, however the United States government chooses to structure things, it needs to be given an adequate amount of time to either show progress or, or lack thereof, and you can't just continuously cycle through these, um, you know, in some cases, pretty significant changes without giving them any opportunity to uh, make a difference. Uh, having said that, um, those of you who know, you know me also know that I'm a big fan of the um, 2001 Rumsfeld Space Commission report organizational structure recommended there is the best one that has ever been laid out. What's quite tragic is that uh, Donald Rumsfeld as Secretary of Defense didn't mention his own report or implement it, but um, <coughs> many important parts of it at least. So in particular, the part that um, I, I think was most important and left undone was creating an Undersecretary of Defense for Space Information and Intelligence. So as you know, all they created was an Undersecretary Intelligence, and Steve Cambone was always Donald Rumsfeld's go-to person for space, so that was not an enduring organizational structure when those people left office. So, um, and actually, the structure they um, recommend was a bit more specific than that because it was not just an Undersecretary of Defense, but it was a Principal Deputy Director of National Intelligence for Space Information and Intelligence. So if you had, at that level, complete control acquisition and policy for national security space, I think you would have the best prospects for having the unity of effort. Having said that, again, um, and living through what um, DOD has done in terms of organization, I do think the principal DOD space advisor is a very good approach because it focuses on the most important things, and I think it has very good prospects um, for success. But time will tell, and the next administration will. Senator McCain will as well, I'm sure. Speaking of Senator McCain, um, it, you know, one of the, the big pushes this year by Senator McCain and the Senate Armed Services Committee has been on a reorganization in DOD. Um, they're talking, you know, they're calling it Goldwater Nichols Reform 2.0. Um, and, you know, looking at the draft proposals that are come out, I mean, space is largely left out of it. Um, and so, yeah, this, this would have been a good opportunity. Right, it's a missed opportunity uh, for doing something like creating an undersecretary position uh, or re-elevating Space Command uh, to be its own unified uh, command. Um, but you know, uh, right now, I don't think the policy community on the you know, Hill, I don't think they're focused that much uh, on uh, you know, organi the organization for the space enterprise, national security space enterprise. Uh, and you know, I think it's a shame because it, this was a chance uh, to do that would have, there are some logical, sensible reforms like Pete outlined from the 2001 uh, Space Commission report uh, that could have been implemented, um, you know, would have satisfied a lot of the hunger for Goldwater-Nichols reform, uh, but instead they're, they're going off and breaking up at and and doing all kinds of other things. Um, again, I agree with my fellow panelists on the many of the issues, but There are some that actually can be useful. So in the end, we have to remember the military and the intelligence community have two very different cultures for two very, you know, for very good reasons. Uh, well, what I have noticed, and I notice this uh, vicariously through the students I've taught at the U.S. Air Force uh, field grade officers who are now entering into uh, senior command, uh, as in they're now colonels as in above, uh, is that when they were deployed in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, they were told before they went, don't talk to 
found that the contingency they were involved in was, well, we have to. So they would ignore the boss's uh, advice back home. They'd walk across the compound to the NSA tent or whatever and say, hey, we have a problem. We need to work together. So you, you had this form of entrepreneurism that was happening among these field grade officers and also these intelligence uh, officers as well, where they were actually working together on the ground, even though back home in headquarters that would have been frowned upon, if not uh, punished. Uh, and that entrepreneurialism has basically borne through I think we're seeing a much more healthier relationship between uh, the military and the intelligence community writ large. I'm not saying there aren't problems, but it's a much healthier relationship. Uh, but there's also a problem, though, within the intelligence community right now, and this applies to space as much as anything else, where for the past 15, 16 years, our intelligence community has been largely focused on covert action rather than actual strategic intelligence collection and analysis. Um, and I think that's where, if we're going to see any tension, that's where it's going to be. Um, as the intelligence community goes back, back to that uh, role um, and covert action becomes more and more, more at least less and less of a, a policy uh, priority. Hi, Talal Kaisi with the UAE Embassy's uh, Trade and Commercial Office. I also direct US-UAE Space Affairs, so thank you for uh, putting the panel together and the uh, great discussion. Uh, I have a two-part question, um, not necessarily both related, but um, I'm interested in the perspective you have on a country like the UAE, who just, you know, like you rightfully said, signed an SSA agreement, uh, can play um, uh, the role that we could play in ensuring uh, space resiliency and space security uh, with um, uh, partner countries like the U.S. And, um, you know, it's not every day you find a country that has the luxury of starting from scratch in terms of a policy that we're putting together, et cetera. And, um, and, and that causes you know a lot of challenges but uh, uh, as well as a lot of opportunities to start uh, by by um, learning from others who have gone through the experience of establishing things from scratch in the past um, and then the second part of the uh, question is on the um, uh, you know ramifications of the deal with Iran right now and the potential aspirations they might have space-wise and the um, ability for them to then start procuring uh, particular space assets to help uh, um, build on those aspirations and what type of uh, you know facilities within the US government will be in place from an export control perspective will we see something similar to what we've seen with the qualitative military edge um, requirements on uh, on the defense side where friendly uh, uh, allies or allies who have been um, uh, partners with the U.S. for a much longer period get certain preferential uh, uh, treatment or capabilities in that in that sense. And um, I think related to both those questions, when you look at the context overall of the joint operations that the UAE has taken part in uh, with our Air Force and our military uh, from Afghanistan to Kosovo to uh, um, Syria right now, and obviously the operations in Yemen, we are very dependent on space assets. And any type of um, impact on either our commercial assets with the um, telecommunication satellites that we have or the GPS um, uh, satellites we depend on for precision guided ammunition uh, to minimize collateral damage are extremely of importance to us. So uh, I'm interested in your thoughts on, on both, uh, on both uh, topics. So this is a topic I know nothing about being the publisher of Space Watch Middle East. So, uh, <laughs> To answer your, 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 your questions, uh, there is a lot the UAE can do, and I, I think they're already doing it, even if it's not necessarily intentional right now. So, for example, the UAE Armed Forces rely on YASAT, they have a hit of Halo. Uh, so, if you will, that's, that's a, a very innovative and cost-effective way of providing an income uh, through essentially a commercial uh, capability. You're also acquiring Falcon Eye, uh, uh, much more controversial in terms of the acquisition itself, but the capability uh, should be something that... Uh, through the auspices of either the NATO partnership that the UAE is developing or through directly through its bilateral relationship with the US is something you could possibly offer as a capability that could be exchanged or in some form of finding some sort of interoperable mechanism whereby the data could be shared through Falcon Eye uh, to allies and then in return uh, the UAE can garner data that it doesn't necessarily have or would find more difficult to uh, provide. I, it's my understanding the UAE and the US are discussing ITAR issues. Um, and hopefully those discussions are, are becoming more productive. Uh, so certainly in things like, for example,
argue they've even done it. I mean, there is one theory going around that the US uh, sailors that were captured by the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, Iranians in January did so because their GPS systems were spoofed by the Iranians, basically leading them into Iranian waters and intentionally so they could be captured for uh, political purposes. So that that uh, theory has not been disproven nor proven, but it's certainly an actual theory, and it's an actual theory, by the way, within the US Navy. Uh, so it is a problem. Uh, and uh, so the UAE, I argue, is doing a lot of things on a number of fronts, not just in space, to make it a very useful partner as well as also to make it maybe a much more uh, a, a modern uh, armed force within the region um, and, and become a more effective one as well. So uh, the UAE's approach to these things in terms of how can you learn lessons from others, uh, I would offer from what I have understood about things is I don't know the answer to that, and I think in terms of what lessons can be learned will depend on what that answer is. Uh, if there is no coherent interagency process, then I fear the UAE may end up making the same mistakes again. Whereas if there's an attempt at these at some sort of interagency process, you'll be in a much better place to avoid those mistakes um, uh, by integrating your policy uh, across the board. So I hope that answers your question. Oh, Iran. Uh, Depends on how Iran goes about its economic reforms. And at the moment, they look to be rather stalled because they have obviously made the internal political um, uh, problems in Iran in terms of the heartland. They've not given up power as easily as many people perhaps over optimistically expected. Uh, and so on. And uh, the economic reforms, if they were to happen, I think would spur demand. I would reply, there are some things the Russians do very well in space. Satellites aren't among them. Uh, launch is pretty good. Satellites. Which I would say to the Iranians who seem to be you know, looking to establish all kinds of relationships with the Russian space industry, good luck to you. So I think in that respect, UAE probably would be fine. Uh, I would say that, um, you know, I, I think in general, a, a good way for a nation operating, especially in military space activities, uh, is actually through the use of hosted payloads. Uh, I'm a big fan of hosted payloads. And so I could envision uh, a scenario where the UAE uh, makes space available uh, on some of their satellites uh, for the U.S. military to put some hosted payloads. Uh, and the hosted payloads, I think, would be of common interest, uh, would be things like infrared payloads, looking at um, you know, perhaps a GPS M code a hosted payload, uh, which would provide more jam resistant GPS coverage in our constellation. Um, you know, there are a number of things. Protected comms could be another hosted payload uh, idea where we could partner with the UAE. Um, and that would help, you know, build out both of our capabilities. Uh, it benefits the U.S. by making our systems that much more resilient uh, in space, just having more payloads up there in different places. Uh, it also ties us together. Uh, more closely, uh, you know, it's good and bad, but if they're our ally, they should be our ally. Uh, and so, uh, you know, having co-use uh, of these space systems, I think in the long run would benefit the relationship. And it's, you know, not that expensive of a way uh, to get involved. Uh, but also, you know, beyond military, uh, looking at closer involvement uh, on civil space exploration as well. Uh, the UAE, uh, you know, more uh, into the, the club of responsible nations using space. Uh, and so partnering with NASA could be a way of doing that as well, uh, particularly for building out the space infrastructure that we'll need to go to Mars one day, which I think is your shared vision. Uh, and so, you know, I think there are a lot of opportunities there uh, to start.
collaborate and deepen our collaboration. I don't have anything to add on Iran, but um, the advice I'd offer UAE is the same I'd offer to any country in your position. It, it would just be think about where your long-term comparative advantages might lie and pursue your own interests because, as you've heard, the U.S. is kind of mercurial on several of these <laughs> issues. So if you do things that are in your long-term uh, competitive advantage interest, then um, you'll be well served. and. You know, space systems from the time you conceptualize them to the end of life is at least 30 years. So only that kind of long-term perspective is really going to serve you very well. And the second thing I'd just bring up is, um, you know, I talked about the need for lower classification levels and declassification of things. So internationally, the United States has the Five Eyes arrangement with uh, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and uh, the United Kingdom. So one of the things as um, the United States government thinks about ways to broaden that up is uh, ways you guys can get into that club, that um, expansion, in my humble opinion, is sorely needed. Um, and it's very interesting dynamics within the current five eyes with respect to that. So that's another very specific challenge with respect to that. Um, to reinforce two things. Um, I absolutely agree with, the, with John's comments about the interagency. Um, I mean, the interagency process is both a blessing and a curse. Uh, but my experience, many countries suffer because they don't have that process the U.S. has to bring together the different agencies and at least talk through different perspectives and, and try and coordinate some sort of government position, um, even though it's very difficult to do so. Uh, so that, I think, would be something that I would recommend. Um, Ah, uh, competitive advantage. Um, absolutely. Figure out what it is that the UAE can or wants to do better than anyone else. And it, it, your, your, your competitive advantage may be geographic position, it may be the relationships you have, it may be a certain sector, a certain technology, whatever that happens to be, do that, do it well, and, and the U.S. will want to work with you. Um, and don't try and come up with something you think the U.S. might want to do, because as as others mentioned, we're kind of fickle. Um, so. Daniel. Hi, Daniel Porras, attorney for LMI Advisors. There was some discussion about developing responses for uh, kinetic uh, anti-satellite capability technology use. Uh, I'm wondering, do you have any ideas on what some of those responses should be? And what would that response be if there is a test from an ally, say, like India? Yeah, you know, uh, my basic point, and I, I preface this, I will point out by saying I didn't have the answers, um, but we need to have some sort of formulation, some sort of rules of engagement, that if you do this, here are the range of responses that I could draw from the U.S., and they need to be actual credible responses, not just that we can do it, but that we actually would do it. And it doesn't have to be in space. Uh, and so, you know, it, it could be everything. A low-end response could be we will levy some economic sanctions uh, if you, you know, do a kinetic test in space, and we need to be able, need to be willing to follow through on it, even with, you know, uh, a country like India. And say, we're serious about this. We're not going to do it. We expect you not to do it either. Uh, and so, you know, there can be a whole range of responses. If it's actual war fighting and someone takes it to space, then you need to step up the consequences. Uh, and that it could be everything from striking something of theirs in space, which I would not recommend uh, kinetically, because then we're just adding to the debris. Uh, but it could be striking a target on the ground. Uh, you know, if we clearly communicate that if you if you knock something of ours out uh, in space, uh, then we reserve the right to knock something of yours out on the ground. Uh, and to date, we really haven't been effective in communicating that. And so I think that has led uh, other countries to at least be confused that there could be some ambiguity here that they might be able to do something to us. In Base without any consequences, and we don't want to be in that situation. Uh, beyond the war fighting consequences, which I think we should have said earlier, during peacetime, if there is a problem, and, and, you know, I've actually had people from the NRC say to me that you know, we, have two, we have two options as currently in, in working groups. We either send a very strongly worded Daymarsh, or we go to World War III. There's, there doesn't seem to be any options in between for me. And I think the rest of the community has let them down by not thinking them through anyway.
take it. Because that in itself then could bring a deterrent value in and of itself. Uh, so at the moment, the way we talk about it is, well, we have our Army, Navy, Air Force and Marines. Uh, of course, you know, if there's body bags turn up to Dover Air Force Base, that's it. Uh, and, you know, but Satellites are something completely separate. There are no sons and daughters to write letters home to and all these sorts of things. Whereas if we make it very clear, this satellite enables this UAV, which enables this particular battalion and all these kind of things. By the way, we take the whole thing as one system, uh, then, you know, that, that might actually provide a bit of clarity to potential adversaries whereby, okay, hold on a minute, if we actually attack that satellite, they're not necessarily going to view it as uh, an, an additional case. It's going to be, well, we've actually impacted the ability of that particular battalion and the, the lives involved and so on that actually might reduce a, an actual credible threat. Trickier if you start thinking about non-kinetic attacks, mm -hmm. right, where it won't necessarily be visible and attribution won't necessarily be clear. What if it's a cyber attack? What if another country uh, uses a laser to dazzle or blind an imaging satellite? Um, then, you know, they know they tried to do it. We would know if it was effective. If we say something about it, then we've given them battle damage assessments. So that now they know it was effective, uh, but they may just assume it's effective. But no one else would know at all. Uh, you know, no other countries would know that this even took place. That's a bad situation to be in. We've got to think through, okay, what are the responses uh, that we're going to have, um, you know, that will de-escalate that situation uh, and contribute to stability and deterrence. And the other aspect also is in terms of, yes, Space, but uh, you know, if an attack against one of those satellites, we just say we're going to target something of value to them. Uh, you know, for us, most of the contingencies we're looking at are going to be in limited war. Right? Um, so let's say we find ourselves, God forbid, in a limited war with China over, say, Taiwan or the South China Sea. They're attacking our satellites, and then someone gets a bright idea. Let's take out their vault stuff on Hainan Island. Well, straight away, we have struck the mainland of China. Then it becomes, oh, okay, then we, we deny them the use of their uh, uh, satellite tracking facilities in Namibia, to which the Chinese say, oh, great, so what? So, yeah, the, the, the actual permutations we have to go through are going to be much more complex and, and contingency driven. But we haven't really done that exercise, at least as far as I'm aware. There may be some classified uh, processes that have been through, but I'd be surprised if anybody at sea level is even aware of them. is raising a lot of key challenges. I mean, these are hard issues. They're very difficult. I mean, if it was easy, I think we would have done it. Um, in my personal opinion, a good place to start is in two areas. Um, a ban on debris creating when a satellite strikes seems like a pretty big no-brainer to me. The only issue really, or you know, among the many issues, is the fact that you know it's kind of locking the barn door after the cow has left the barn. So, uh, you know, who's that really affecting now? But at least it would help with the debris issue and it would affect kinetic anti-satellite debris creating stuff. So, and then you can talk about what altitude and, you know, there's, there's all kinds of permutations of that. Uh, a second thing is, um, you know, the code of conduct was a pretty lame document, okay? But the one thing about it that I actually liked and I think would be useful is having some standing body whose job it is to interpret what it is that we're signing up to do, to promote responsible behavior in space. So if you don't have some standing body who's charged with that responsibility, I don't know that you're ever going to get there. I mean, we can't do this unilaterally. We can't share everything. We've demonstrated this huge unwillingness to do that over decades about what we know. So it's going to have to be a part of the mix in terms of how does the international community know what's going on in space, what can they attribute, voluntary things that are already um, obligations in international law. So that's really interesting. But people don't go back to that, and there is no standing body, no mechanism within the United States Treaty to uh, bring those things into complete uh, compliance and fulfillment and, and uh, um, finalize and, and settle on the interpretation of them. So um, I, I would uh, try and advance in those two areas. add one more uh, complication to the mix. Um, the one substantive area of the code that, ha that really met challenges was the issue of self-defense in space, right? Uh, 
Um, most, most of the parts of the code, there was no challenge of the substance. It was mostly how it was done or who was involved. Uh, but that was the one substantive area that had a lot of challenges. Uh, and, and it basically came down to there were some countries who felt it important to have that included, even though it's already part of the UN Charter. Um, there were a, a range of countries that basically felt that it should not be included because ideologically they're opposed to any military activities in space, so therefore there's no need to talk about self-defense. Uh, which ignores the fact that military has always been part of space. But I think it was a much broader part of the countries that were uncertain what that meant, right? There are other domains. We, we, you know, there's a better idea, I think, of what self-defense means in the context of air operations or ground operations or sea operations. There's still debates, obviously, but there's a much a stronger discussion about it. Um, and, but there's been virtually no discussion of what that means in the context of space. And can you really trade a satellite for a ground center uh, or, or is it really the more moral option to take out the satellite versus taking out something that's full of people? So, so I think there needs to be a broader discussion both within the U.S. government on the law of armed conflict issue, but also internationally like we do in all these other domains that to date has not existed in space. Well, we're just out of time. I think we have time for one last question. Um. My question is more about Guy Thomas, I, um, I've been working in the electronic warfare intelligence business since 1968, and from 2003 until 2012, I was the science advisor for maritime surveillance. And from September of 2009, until June of 2010, I worked on the national space policy, and about 15% of it was my words. Uh, we did make that list, that you, John, that you, you mentioned. We made that list when we started out as to what, what capabilities were military and what could be civilian. And uh, Rob Emanuel gave us a tasking memo that basically said, I want you to do three things. One, protect our, our technical means of intelligence, our, our space systems, and, and both make sure that they stayed preeminent and make sure that they were safe. That was a, a, a subcomponent. Uh, two, strengthen our industry. And three, figure out a way that we could use space to have all everybody in the world join hands and sing Kumbaya, basically. <laughs> and that was the policy, interestingly enough, that I worked on. Uh, I worked on that because I'd written a, a, a paper saying uh, if we all got together and worked on the maritime domain to solve the maritime surveillance problem, which is a global problem, uh, it would be a, a good thing. Um, we're still working on that. That's actually the name of my, my company, Collaboration in Space International Global Maritime Awareness. Um, but do you guys see any evidence that we have ever gotten Action 3 done? It appears to me we have focused on the, uh, on the space security aspects of it, not the other two. I think part of it, and uh, uh, Todd uh, alluded to this earlier in his actual uh, remarks, uh, which is, you know, we need to find a role for NASA. Uh, you know, there's a lot of distrust in the, the National Security Council about NASA. NASA seems a bit of a rogue elephant. Um, you know, they go off to China without telling anybody to talk to the Chinese, you know, all that kind of thing. And, uh, and so certainly maybe they need more discipline on that front. But, uh, but you know, that's largely a presidential problem. And, and I mean, it's not necessarily specific to Obama. There's always been a presidential problem. Oh, but I think it, it's a reflection on how much the president is able to express an interest in, in that kind of thing, as much as also whether the president personally has an interest in that, uh, uh, in terms of the, the coherence of the approach. Uh, so if the president is engaged, then you're more likely to see a much more coherent approach and a much more multifaceted approach. If the president is unable to engage because... I think in the end, the problem is structural. Uh, you know, from what I understand of you know, presidential history and its involvement in the space program, the worst thing that could have happened to the space program is presidential direct involvement. I mean, John may disagree with that, but, uh, but you know, my, my conclusion is that actually it's a curse rather than a, a, 
there are other reasons why NASA isn't necessarily doing what we hope it would do, but, uh, but I think that's a large part of the answer um, in, in terms of how we go about doing it. But, I mean, it's not just the president itself. I mean, Congress and Congress has. So if your point was about, you know, space situation awareness and broader, you know, space domain awareness and international cooperation, I think, I think it's gotten better, but I'm not sure that it was anything the U.S. government did. Um, you know, for the, for the first few years of that effort, I mean, my sense is that the national security community really resisted that effort, right, because they, they you know, there, there, is, there was an, an intent, we want everything to go through us, there we can control the data and, and so forth. Um, but I think despite those efforts, you have seen much more interest internationally in SSA, from, right, from a wide range of companies. And the, un, the, un, un, what, the unknown thing that happened was the commercial sector. You know, there's now private sector activities in SSA and pre right, capabilities that are being developed um, that rival and, in my opinion, in some cases surpass what the U.S. government can do. And th then the big question becomes, how does this government take advantage of that? Uh, to stifle it. That's certainly a tool that we have neglected. But there are, you know, just like there's a lot of cooperation in SSA, we've seen also uh, signs of interest in, in global uh, maritime and awareness cooperation. Right, okay, so you know then what's going on right now between the US and Japan. Well, it sounds like this conversation could keep on going. However, I think probably people's schedules require they return um, from this discussion. So please join me in thanking this panel for what's been a very interesting. Discussion.